Hello, Hawkeye Nation. Welcome to Chat from the Old Cap. My name is Tony Hakes. I'm the Director of Regional Programs here at the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. Very excited to have you be part of our program today. We've got an absolutely wonderful guest and it's going to be telling us some pretty cool stories about one of the most famous, if not the most famous athlete, student athlete ever to come out of the state of Iowa. Before we begin, I do want to do a, a shout out to our, our friends, alumni, and fans in Florida. Uh, uh, please know that we're thinking about you if you're joining us from there today. I hope that you're safe and that uh, everyone else will obviously be recording this and, and be able to send it out if you missed it, but we're certainly thinking about you today. And we've got great clubs and great alumni friends and fans in Florida. As you're joining us, if you wish to have closed captionings for today's program, you simply need to hit that button in the lower right corner that says more, and then you can uh, uh, scroll up to where it says uh, show closed captions, which is great. Also, if you would like to ask a question, you can do so at any time using the Q&A function. We do have some questions that we're going to be asking uh, our guests as we sort of get through our program, uh, but we will have some time to get to those questions towards the end or even throughout uh, the program. Like I mentioned before, it will be recorded, so if you wish to watch it again, uh, just like you may wish to watch the Niall Kinnick documentary again and again, uh, you can do so. We'll post it to our YouTube page at a later date, and uh, you can we'll send out that um, link so you can watch it as many times as you'd like. I do want to welcome our very special guest today, Scott Sipker. He's going to be dis discussing his most recent project, which is Kinnick, the documentary. Scott, who is also known as the Iowa Nice Guy, the Iowa royalty with the Iowa Nice Guy videos that have been fantastic, uh, produced, directed, and narrated this 90-minute film about Iowa legend Niall Kinnick, who graduated in 1940 with a BA. Scott began his career as a stage actor at Iowa State University. So Scott, you're gonna be one of the, the first people that is not a University of Iowa employee or graduate to be in our program, but I can't think of anything better to bring our friends from the West um, over here with us than, than talking about one of our greatest athletes. Uh, but you earned your degree in, in psychology from Iowa State and later co-founded Iowa Filmmakers, a film company responsible for the hit series of Iowa Nice videos that made a two season run on ESPN's college football game day, which is amazing. Scott, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me, Tony. It, uh, I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, we are too. And I, I told myself, so I, I've seen the Kinnick video. Of, if, even if you watch the trailer, you know, that's it, for those of us that, that know his story and know at least some about him, we certainly can learn a lot more from your documentary. Um, really, really amazing. So I told myself, I'm not going to give away any spoilers today. Uh, if I feel like a spoiler's coming up, or Scott, if you feel like that there might be a spoiler coming up, um, we'll give you all a, a heads up to maybe just turn your, your microphone off for a second. But um, I'll try not to do that, but I do have some great questions that I'll be referencing uh, about that. So Scott, Iowa State grad, how did an Iowa State grad uh, come to make a documentary about the, the most well-known student athlete in Iowa history? Well, I'm a kid who grew up in rural Carroll County in a in a town of 101 people and 26 pets uh, called Mount Carmel. And I grew up as a Hawkeye fan in the 80s. I mean, pretty much everybody in Iowa at that time because of Hayden Fry uh, was a, a Hawkeye fan. I grew up in a house though, you know, Iowa State wasn't really a threat at the time. So my dad wore both, uh, both colors. Uh, and my dad is what they call a tavern hawk. Same with my mom, they didn't go to the University of Iowa but they rooted for the Hawkeyes. So I knew growing up kind of the bullet points of Niall's life. I didn't know what was in between those bullet points, which we were able to put into the documentary. Um, and then, you know, I became an Iowa State fan when I went to Iowa State. I followed a girl there who, uh, you know, didn't have any idea I even had a crush on her. But, uh, you know, what do you do? You're young and stupid at the time. Uh, but I became an I Iowa State fan and I never lost my Hawkeye fandom. So I really am one of those annoying people who is a uh, Scott divided, as I like to say. And uh, it's certainly the way my career has developed, promoting both universities and promoting the state of Iowa in general. When both universities are doing well, it's good for me. So uh, now I have skin in the game. Certainly. Well, that's great. And we and we love a Scott divided. Um, you know, obviously your alma mater is always going to be, you know, near and dear to you, but we love that you've taken this project on and, and um, we'll, we'll take a Scott divided over a Scott not divided. So we, we, <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I don't know how, like you said, you kind of grew up sort of in between, but as you did your research on Nile, did you ever come across anything about the University of Iowa that, you know, surprised you in a good way that you found, you know, maybe didn't know um, before you started this project? 
I really didn't know how much of a struggle it was to build Iowa Stadium. Now we know it as Kinnick Stadium. I I didn't know it was the university was having a real hard time affording the football field, the football stadium, and that it really was when Niles Ironman season, the 1939 season came through, really helped solidify that stadium as, as a good idea. And so there was, you know, the Hawkeyes had some good teams. They had with Duke Slater in 1921, but they had some pretty awful football in the mid thirties, which I, I was not aware of either. And it makes the Ironman story all that more impressive and Niles story specifically more impressive that he decided to go to a university that legitimately had one of the worst football programs in the Midwest at the time. And so he took on that challenge and took the program and raised it higher than it had been in a few decades or in a decade or so. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. And I love in the documentary how, you know, you show a lot of pictures where people are just parked right next to the stadium, you know, before the hospital experience. Those spots today yeah. might cost, a, you know, a, a decent <laughs> amount of coin, but you, it's, it's great to see them parked right there. And again, you talk about, um, you know, how they, in the, in the documentary, how they struggled to fill those seats and, you know, that they were missing thousands of people. And so um, it's, Again, not trying to give away anything, but you can certainly see, um, you know, the impact that Niall and people like Duke Slater had on, on the program. Uh, so Iowa Nice Guy videos, fantastic. Iowa wrestling. I, I know that you and Dan Gable worked hard to save wrestling for the Olympics. Um, how did you kind of get Which I, I take full credit for. I take full credit for saving Olympic wrestling, but yes, continue. <laughs> but no, that, that, that's great. Credit uh, is well deserved. Um, how did you, you know, we were talking about this the other day. You're sort of one of the original kind of content generating genre people. And I know those videos are almost 10 years old, but how did you get your start sort of in acting and in these web series and kind of hosting these types of things? Yeah, I, I never, I was going to be a counselor. That was what I wanted to be a therapist uh, when I went to college. And then my sophomore year, I decided I wanted to be in a college play. So I took an acting class and that acting class changed the course of my life. I uh, still got my psychology degree because it was hard enough to convince my parents that psychology degree was good enough. And uh, switching to theater would have been an even tougher sell, but uh, ended up taking plenty of acting classes. Then went to um, LSU for acting grad school uh, for a bit before coming back to Iowa during the tax film credits when we had the best tax film credits in the country. And, you know, there were films being made. Adrian Brody was here, Forrest Whitaker, you know, Oscar winners. And then, of course, the scandal, uh, the tax film credits where they got eliminated. And then I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, what do I do now? I, do I move to Los Angeles? Do I move to New York? Do I stay right here? And ultimately, I looked at the landscape and I thought, there are 25,000 white dudes with receding hairlines, glasses, and beards out in Los Angeles. And they're probably a little bit better looking, a little bit more talented, maybe a little taller, maybe a little funnier, maybe can sing and dance. Like my best chance of making it is to utilize the resource, the best resource that Iowa has. And that's not our coin, our soybeans, our pigs. No, the, the best resource Iowa has is Iowans, the people. And so I thought, well, maybe this is my path to having a filmmaking career, an acting career. I know that sounds like you think you could do that in Iowa. I did think I could do it. And I guess we are proving that it can be done. And really it's because Iowans are incredible and they want to help you. They're like, hey, come stand on my shoulders. And so I have been and somehow been able to craft an amazing life where I get to live in a place where I complain about the weather and not the traffic. And I'm all for that. That's great and so true. And uh, my team is fortunate enough to, to travel a fair amount. And, you know, we get all the time, Iowa Nice, is that a, a real thing? And absolutely, you know, if your car breaks down, someone is going to stop and yeah. offer you help or a ride or invite you to their house to have a, a hot dish of some kind. Um, so, these are all, all really great points. And um, I don't have a beard, but, you know, we have some other things in common. I, I do wear glasses at night. But, um, you know, the, the Iowa Nice series, so sort of how did that come to be? And I, I, I know you've done some PBS work and some hosting there, but, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of views between all these videos. How did, how did that project, you know, kind of help you launch your career? 
Yeah, the filmmaking uh, group, uh, Brenda Dunphy, who's a producer on the Kinnick Project, and Paul, and then Paul Benedict, who's one of our directors, we had kind of started this film troupe after the tax film credit scandal because we were like, well, we got we to gotta produce our own work. Um, and it was uh, a dramatic web series that took place in the 1930s following two hitmen around Iowa while they were helping escort Templeton Rye to Chicago. And this is a very serious project, very, you know, obviously a violent time and it's dramatization. So, you know, it's fictional, but we said it in Iowa at the time. Turns out you need millions and millions of dollars to do a period piece. And we had a, none of those millions of dollars. So uh, we kind of put our heads together and, and eventually uh, Paul came up with this idea to do this little two minute essay. And he wrote it and uh, there was some swearing in it. And he's a good Christian boy, so he doesn't swear. So he thought, who can I send this to who's okay with swearing? And so he sent it to me. And I remember reading it. I was working in a cubicle job at the time. And I read through the script. I started crying. I was laughing so hard. And I was like, wow. So we went out and we filmed it uh, a couple of days before the caucuses in 2012. And we put it out. And little did I, we thought we were going to get like 10,000 views. Because at the time, we were getting our videos were getting like 300. But we're like, this is good. This is going to get 10,000. And then all of a sudden, we're over 100,000. We're over 400,000. I'm getting calls from all across the world to do interviews. So Slovenian TV is asking me to do an interview. I don't speak Slovenian. I'm not even sure I know where it is. Uh, but, you know, then we're BBC and CNN and the world for 700. We eventually get over a million views on YouTube. It just changed the course of my career and of my life. That's incredible. So, you know, a little idea that you thought was hilarious and, and, and maps your career out, which is, is really cool. Um, so how would you describe, uh, so the documentary has been out for about a month now. Um, how would you sort of describe the response to that so far? When you're making something like this and pouring so many years of your life into it, you hope that people like it. And I have been very happy that People don't just like it, they love it. People are going to the theater and they're breaking out in spontaneous applause at the end of the film. I'm not, nobody's there to applaud. They're just, you know, they feel this urge to want to applaud. I, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting this to have a theatrical run. We've now been in over 20 theaters. And that is, oh, it's, I'm, I'm just really, I'm elated by the response. You no, know, our trouble is we have a zero dollar marketing budget. So getting the word out is our challenge. We've made a good film. People really do like it. I mean, Hawkeye fans in some ways are, see it almost like a pilgrimage to watch this film, or go somewhere to watch it if it's in the theater or stream it online. And that, I, I just, um, I, I feel very, very fortunate that somehow nobody had the idea over the last 80 years to do a feature link documentary and now I'm kidding. So I'm so happy that nobody did that. And we got the opportunity to get to know Niall in this way. That's, that's great. And as I can't, broken record here, if you haven't had a chance to see it, please go out and see it. I watched it in a, in a couple different pieces. And at one point during the film, kind of towards the end, I had to stop and go to, into a different meeting. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay. Get it together. You can, you can leave this meeting. You can go in and, and, and still be creative with this sort of on the back of your mind. But eliciting those kind of emotions and, uh, um, you know, spontaneous clapping and applauding and cheering and laughing and crying, I think, is um, it describes the film so well. So uh, let's dive a little deeper into the film. Um, so what was it kind of like to go on this journey to, to find the, not necessarily the real Niall Kinnick, but find out more about who the real Niall Kinnick was? Well, it was a long journey. Um, we're very fortunate that the family did such a good job of preserving many of the letters and scrapbooks and war journals that Niall crafted himself and that the family put together as well. So happy that we're lucky they, they donated those to the university. And then in 1959, when the first collection was donated to the university, that the archives the special collections at the University of Archive, or University of Iowa, I have to give a huge shout out to what they've done for decades to categorize, preserve, scan, 
has been and and give access to uh, these wonderful documents. I mean, really, the only way you can get to know Nile, except for this one other one, which we can talk about, Don Bice, who's in our film. But other, without Don Bice, Nile's first cousin, the, our only window into the real Nile Kinnick is what is left in those letters, notebooks, and scrapbooks. And so, just going through that mountain of information was a lot but it was a joyous process. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it was easy or that it was always a happy adventure. There were, when you're making a film, there are lots of ups and downs. There's moments where you think this, we're never gonna get this done. Or how are we, how are we gonna tell that part of the story? Or you'll, you'll spend months of your life working on one section and then you realize, oh, that section's not even gonna make the final cut. So there's, there's a lot of challenges that go into making this film or to making any film, but I just, in the end of the day, I just feel like just so lucky to have gotten to know Niall in such an intimate way over the last couple of years of my life. And I can speak for the rest of the team as well. Just really lucky. And even though this was a long, laborious process, the amount of joy that was extracted through just the process and now the, the destination that we're at has been... I mean, it is, it's a life's work that I hope will outlive us all. Uh, you know, you're pulling boxes and boxes of his letters and documents and journals and pages and pages, you know, it, and it's all, all of it's so eloquent and thoughtful. And, you know, if you think of it today, modern email, yes, I can make that meeting. That's you know, quite different than him being mm -hmm. very sort of existential and thoughtful and, and so genuine. Um, I know you cover a lot of, you know, interesting things about him in the film, but what, what are some of the more interesting things that stuck out to you in, in sort of your research? Well, as I tell everybody, this film's 90 minutes long, and for about 87 of those minutes, you're going to learn something new about Niall. It, there's just so much to him, and his life is, is fairly well documented uh, throughout up until the end, uh, which is frustratingly and tragically undocumented. But one of the couple of the things that I just find so charming is like that Niles nickname when he's growing up was June. He's running around Adele as a little seven year old. People are calling him June. They don't call him now, they call him June. And I just find that to be so charming. And also I find it really charming and endearing how you can tell Niall got butterflies when he was around girls and that, you know, he was looking for a wife, but boy, he really liked going on dates and he, the way he writes about the girls, you can just, you can hear that innocence in there, but also, I mean, he's a young man and I find it just so, so endearing. Uh, and then his sense of humor. We don't think of Niall's sense of humor ever. I mean, I don't, ever remember before I got into his letters and notebooks and stuff, but to, to, to realize, you know, obviously you, everybody has some sort of sense of humor, but he had a, a really good observational humor. And we able to bring that out in the documentary, like the way that he writes about when he's on in military training and when he has to <laughs> go to the bathroom and it's just open stalls and all these, all these toilets and all, there's these big lugubrious men, as he calls it, just sitting around, waiting aspirants, he uses that term. And it's just so, it's just revealing Niall as the person and not the bronze statue. And so those are some of my favorite things that we got to learn about Niall. But as I said, you learn so much about him that this, this film will really teach you the ins and outs, as best as we can tell, of, of the real Niall Kinnick. That, that is amazing. And you, you, you know, so many of us are just used to the, the statue and seeing some film and hearing his speech at the games. But you when know, you peel back some of those layers, he is a, a young man with it, it, you know, it's kind of thrust into fame and dealing with that and, and then dealing with you know, sharing this, this restroom with all these other people. It, it, he's, he's a guy, he's a human, he's a dude. Uh, yeah, Nile was legitimately one of the most famous people in the country in, 19, in the end of 1939 and the early part of 1940. Uh, one commentator at the time said that he was in competition with Shirley Temple as America's new favorite personality. He, 
where he would go, people would know who he was. And he even writes about once he gets later on in his uh, military training, how it's kind of nice that he's a little bit out of the spotlight now. It's the first time in a few years that he can have a little bit of privacy to himself. And it just shows that uh, even though he, he was in his early 20s, uh, he, was, he was really in tune with who he was as a person. Yeah, and I know you talk about how popular he was in the documentary. So uh, not going to do a spoiler alert here, but uh, just so everyone knows that you know you, you dive into that deeper, which is super cool. Um, I really enjoyed a lot of the footage and footage I hadn't seen and color footage. Uh, I think maybe like a lot of other people, I didn't realize he never left the field. <laughs> so, I mean, I knew some guys in high school that didn't really leave the field, offense, defense, special teams. But I mean, that's so rare now. You know, what's sort of your, your thought on that and take on that? His, his, you know, I think he, he said he had 600 and some accountable for 600 and some yards and an interception and a, a six touchdowns. Yeah. How, do you, how do you think the game has changed? <laughs> well, it, certainly back then the rule was is that when you subbed out in a quarter, you couldn't come back until the next quarter. So what most teams would do would be they'd sub out their best players with, say, two to three minutes left in the quarter, let them rest, and then bring them back fresh at the top of the next quarter. Well, the Ironmen, uh, the 1939 Hawkeye team, they just didn't have enough numbers to do that. And so – many of the players played the full 60 minutes, including Niall. And Niall, <laughs> he was, I mean, he, he was one of the best punters in the nation. He was obviously the best player in the nation on offense. Uh, on top of that, he still is tied for most single season interceptions. Uh, uh, Desmond King just tied him a few years ago for the total. I think it's eight, eight or nine uh, interceptions in one season. Now still has that record. He also was the field goal kicker. He was a drop kicker at the time. So he played all three phases of the game. Now, of course, we, players don't do that anymore. Uh, with the rule changes, with substitutions, obviously, there you can go in and, and come out whenever uh, you want to or whenever the coaches want you to. And the game certainly was a, a more aerobic process. It was less passing, more like more rugby scrum. Like we're just going to... We're just going to run right in at each other. Uh, the good thing about Nile, though, is that uh, even though he played halfback, he could pass the ball really well. And he could do it both right-handed and left-handed. So when you see the film, you'll get to see game footage of him throwing some really nice passes deep down the field. Even though Erwin Prossi was the quarterback, he was a good quarterback too. But Nile was an, the all-around best player. I mean, heck, he was the best player in the country in 1939, as proven by the Heisman Trophy and also the AP picking him as male athlete of the year over people named Joe DiMaggio and Joe Lewis, the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And Joe DiMaggio hit 381 that year and Niall was still chosen to be the male athlete of the year. And Joe Lewis had four knockouts to defend his heavyweight title. So Niall certainly left, um, left an impression on not just the state of Iowa, but on the country at large. Absolutely incredible. And we have some former Iowa athletes on the call today. And I'm, I'm sure that if we didn't, if you didn't know that he stayed on the field the entire game and kicked field goals, um, I, I'm sure that's pretty impressive. We also have- And, some... and just for reference, that's why they were called the Ironmen, is um, that because most of the players played the full 60 minutes, uh, their coach gave them the nickname, the Ironmen. And uh, we actually have some relatives of a former Ironman on the call today. I'm, awesome. uh, I'm going to keep their uh, information private, but um, got to know them over the years, which is uh, incredible as well. Um, so, so I think you, you know, I touched on a little bit earlier about his writing. And of course, we all know the University of Iowa is the writing university. We have the number one fine arts program. We have the number two overall writing program. Um, what did you discover about his, and I know we touched on this a little bit, but what did you discover about his writing that was interesting or different or unique or stood out to you? He certainly, he had a way with words. And you can see that in his father's writings. His father uh, is, is heavily featured in the documentary as well. His mother isn't. And that's because uh, after Niall had passed, uh, she destroyed most, if not all, of their correspondence, which she admitted to the university when they made the donations 
um, of Niall's papers. So Francis, his mother is absent from the documentary, heartbreakingly to me, but we just don't have their interactions back and forth. But I imagine uh, she, she being the daughter of the former governor of Iowa and having raised three very eloquent children, she herself from all reports was very intelligent. In fact, uh, Niall's mom and dad were in the same high school class in Adel. They first finished first and second in their grade with grades, the best grades with uh, Francis taking the lead. She was number one in her class and the dad was number two. So there are good genetics here inside the brains of the Kinnick boys. Um, but they were, they were also eloquent and very honest with each other. You could say that there was a lot of love going back and forth and, and kind of Niles, the favorite moment that I have of Niles writings really is in that third war journal where it becomes less presentational. And I don't use that word uh, in a negative way, just Niall had a presentational style. He was a statesman, even in you know his late teens, early twenties, as you hear in the hyphen speech. Uh, but his third war diary, his last war diary, seems much more stream of consciousness. And if he's not really writing it for posterity, posterity stay, sake, it's really just him jotting down ideas, contemplating different things, really wrestling with issues of the day and trying to figure out what is it that I think. And I love, I love that those, that third notebook is just because it's not presentational, it feels like it's completely revealing. Definitely notice a difference in the film as his last war journal, you know, that third war journal comes to fruition. Like you, you point out a lot of different things that are, um, you know, not quite the same as his early writing, which is really revealing. Um, so mentioned earlier, you've, you've We've seen, you've shown us footage, footage that a lot of us have never seen, and some of it in color. And I love some of the shots of Notre Dame in their green. And Iowa's colors were kind of similar to Notre Dame at the time. Uh, how challenging was it for you to track down this footage and, and piece it together? Luckily, because the university archives, the special collection there, again, I, I give them a huge shout out. Um, all that stuff was at the university. The, the challenging part was I spent time trying to find the original game reels because I feel like they have to exist. What we have in the film is, you know, it looks like from a best we can forensically say is uh, from the quality, seems like they were um, transferred to a digital copy maybe a, dec a couple decades ago. And I was unsuccessful in finding the original game reels because I'd love to take those original game reels and use the present day technology to, to get even more data off of them. Uh, so that was challenging and frustrating that, that we weren't able to find those. But, but because the university archives in their brilliance decided to do that long ago, we still have, even though it's not the best quality, we have good enough quality to be able to put it on the screen and for you to see these color reels, which again, I didn't know existed either. So I, I was so happy to see that and, and to be able to utilize it. And, you know, when you see somebody in a still photo, you get one impression of them. But when you see the way that they move, I really feel like it gives you a much better indication of that person, who they really were. And so getting to see Niall not only run around the, the football field and throw the ball and pass the ball, or sorry, pass the ball, run the ball, punt the ball, kick the ball through the uprights, you're just getting him to see him the way he moved by a microphone. You can tell there is a humbleness there, but there is a quiet confidence. It's somebody who is sure of himself and, but not pompous. And you could, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just uh, projecting way too much onto this, but I really feel like just seeing Niall standing there silent behind a microphone at a pep rally, you can just tell a lot more about his essence. And so we're so lucky that even though we don't have a ton of footage of Nile, what exists does feel to be, it does really add to the story, in my opinion. Those shots of him at the pep rally are stunning. So powerful. He doesn't speak, but he's got his you know, Letterman's jacket. It's in color. 
um, those images were just were really, really powerful. I also, you know, we, we many of us have seen sort of the usual footage, you know, the famous um, touchdown, but I was shocked when Don, you know, his cousin was even watching and saying, oh, I don't remember him like being this shifty. And, yeah. and you see it pan yeah. out on the film. I mean, you, you really captured a, a side of him that I don't, you know, can't, can't say that a lot of us have seen. Yeah. Before. And can I, I just take a moment to, to talk yeah. about Don for a second. We, Please. you know, when we started out, we didn't know if we'd find anybody with living memories of Niall Kinnick. So we, we, we went through all the rosters and the family lineage and we just, we didn't think we'd come across Don Bice, who has never really been sat down and interviewed extensively before. Don is now in his middle nineties. He's about seven and a half to eight years younger than Niall. He grew up with Niall in Adel. He's roughly the same age as now his younger brother, George. And so Don got to pal around with Niall as a child. He caught passes and punts with him. He ate meals with him. And to find somebody who has living, intimate memory of Niall Kinnick was such a gift. I think we have a good documentary without Don Bice in it. I think we have a much better documentary because Don not only is was there, but he's an excellent storyteller as well. And so we're so fortunate that Again, Don Bice has been overlooked for decades and decades and decades, and, and we are able to find him. Uh, really, I just, I, I, again, just sometimes I just think I might be the luckiest guy in the world. Huge piece of the documentary, uh, you know, adds so much and such a personal touch and um, the way that you incorporated it in, into that and his stories are it's amazing. You could tell how much Niall had on someone he knew in person, right? Like mm -hmm. we see how much he has on us now, but how much he had on, on his younger cousin. And you know, there's probably not a lot of living people that say they can caught a couple touchdowns. And I think how there to... are zero people other than Don. <laughs> I honestly think Don is the last person on earth that can say that. I, I, I mean, we looked, I could be wrong. Hopefully there are other people out there, but to the extent that Don got to spend time with for years with Niall, I, I, we're so fortunate to have found him. Yeah, definitely a, a great piece of the story. Um, so a couple other questions here and we'll open it up. We have had some questions come through the Q&A. So anybody out there that would like to submit a, a question for Scott, please use that Q&A function on the bottom, bottom of your screen. Um, do you have any future plans for the documentary? Any kind of follow-up? Are you going to find that dog that appears on the field in the Notre Dame game that appears to be calling plays in the huddle, not just random, uh, like kind of, kind of what's next as far as what, you, what you're doing with the documentary? Yeah, the Notre Dame at the time had an Irish Terrier as a mascot. And I guess back then it was okay if the dog just got to run around the field. You'll notice that when you see the film. Uh, maybe we'll do a documentary on that Irish Terrier. I think it's called Cashmore Mike, I think was the, uh, with the dog's name. But, um, you know, we have a whole... Right now, what we're trying to do, we're still doing a theatrical run. The film is available on Vimeo to stream, which is um, an, a really good film service for independent films. It's on a lot of smart TVs. There's an app you can get. You can also stream it from your phone if you have Roku or, or uh, Chromecast or however you stream on your phone. Uh, but as we wrap up the theatrical run, we will be eventually having Blu-ray and DVDs available. And we will also, I can't, quite announce it yet, but we will be in say four to six weeks, we'll be on some streaming services that you may have heard of more of than Vimeo. That's all I should say at this point, but you, you probably extrapolate uh, from that. So yeah, if you stay tuned, if Vimeo is, is a little too difficult for you to get on your, your TV or you're not around a theater in Iowa to go see it in the theater, you, it'll get easier, I promise, as we, as we continue to launch this across the country. Um, and so that's really our focus right now. And then we have, there's so, the state of Iowa has so many great stories. I, I want to tell them and not just documentary form. I mean, certainly our next project uh, eventually that I'll start fundraising for will be the Jack Trice documentary. And, and then Duke Slater, I'd love to do something on Duke Slater. We, there, the original cut of the Kinnick documentary was over two hours long. We cut it down to 90 minutes. And most of the section that was taken out is the story of how Kinnick Stadium got to be called Kinnick Stadium instead of Iowa State. And that brings in the Duke Slater, um, doc, or Duke Slater story, which I really love to tell. And so we have that. Kate Shelley is, was a hero um, in 1881, just outside of it, right here in central Iowa, saved a bunch of people's lives 
um, crawling across a train bridge. If you haven't heard the Kate Shelley story, and that's a that's a screenplay that uh, uh, a partner Paul that I, we've mentioned before, one of the directors of the film, and I have put together. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to do that. Valentine Road is thought. Anyway, we have so many stories. We have there's Donna Reed would be a great story to tell. John Wayne be a great story to tell. There are so many amazing stories to tell in Iowa. And I think when you see the Kinnick documentary, we're not trying to tell them in like rah-rah Hawkeye way or rah-rah state of the Iowa way, state of Iowa way. It's really, we're just coming at it from a national perspective that this is an interesting story. And it just so, so happens that it takes place in Iowa. But of course, as an Iowan, I want to tell Iowa stories and share them with the nation. And uh, that's what we're going to try to continue to do. And the more successful Kinnick is, the more likely those other projects will be to happen. That's great. Well, we look forward to um, learning more about uh, uh, this new streaming service or this new um, venue that you're going to be using for a streaming service. I did have someone ask how to um, view the video, so I'll, I'll ask that my colleague Derek um, puts that up in the chat so people can click on that link. Yeah. Uh, couple couple sports questions. Um, in your research, who would you put on your Mount Rushmore of Iowa football? Oh, oh if All you're the just doing athletes. Well, Kinnick, obviously, he'd be in the George Washington spot. Um, I think you'd have to you'd have to have Chuck Long up there. Duke Slater is in there, and then what do we do? Audrey Devine, uh, Alex Karras. I mean, Ed put Podolak up there. I mean, he's done so. There's that that fourth spot is really tough. I I really do think Duke and Nile. Are, those are secure. I think that's almost unarguable, especially now that Duke, as of last year, got put in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He was just, he's one of the greatest linemen of his generation. And I know normally on Mount Rushmore's, you don't put offensive or defensive linemen. It's usually reserved for, for the skill positions. But Duke was so good, so good. I mean, he might have been the best lineman of his generation. I think he goes up there. And now his name's on the field. So, I mean, but then, you know, like somebody from my time, like a Tim Dwight, I think there's an argument there. He's, he might be the most spectacular runner I've ever seen with the football in his hands. I mean, incredible. But um, those who, it's really tough. On different days, those other two spots would probably be taken up by different people. But I'm definitely going Nile and Duke and uh, the one and, uh, and two slots on our Mount Rushmore. That's, that's great. Um, Chuck Long was actually on one of our early episodes of Chat from the Old Cap and had some really, really great stories. So glad to hear that. Uh, you didn't happen to be at LSU during the catch with Warren Holloway, were you? I, I was not. But when oh, okay. I was there, I wore, I wore, as I told you, you know, I'm a Hawkeye fan still. And so I would wear Hawkeye gear. And, um, <laughs> and I remember trying to talk trash about that event like to LSU people, and they had no idea the catch. What are you talking about? I'm like, the catch! I mean, don't you know? Yeah, come on. And uh, no, in LSU, uh, if you don't win a national title, one, they're going to fire you as a coach, and two, they will forget your team totally. So the fact that uh, that amazing pass uh, happened, uh, it, it's meaningful to us, but I couldn't extract any pain from the LSU Tigers. Yeah, but, you know, maybe he goes in that fourth spot just from pure legend and lore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, got a couple people just saying thank you, thank you, thank you. They, they love the documentary. Um, here's something you might be interested in. Uh, someone out there says, my father was captain of the Iowa basketball team while Ni Niall Kinnick played at Iowa and they mm. were friends. I have a framed photo of Niall, of Niall that he autographed to my father. Wondered if you would be interested in it. Do you want me to answer? I would love you. I, I would. Yes, <laughs> I would love to see. It. I'd love to see. It. Yeah, please send. It's been really cool to see people have been sending me letters um, that Niall wrote to a family member. Uh, and yeah, so please, yeah, please send that over. I mean, Niall was. Most people don't know he played baseball, basketball, and football at the university um, through various times at at, uh, at Iowa. And of course, he was he was good at everything. Yeah, well, and I'll, and I'll have uh, my my colleague put your website up in our chat if he hasn't already, and cool. people can contact you through there. And that sounds like that might be a, a great potential story as well. Um, his his football career very well documented, military career not as much. 
Um, I had a couple questions come in here through uh, email. Um, when Niall enlisted in the Navy in 1941, most Americans, including aviator hero Charles Lindbergh, were fighting against the Nazis in World War II in Europe. How did Niall come to view that Americans should fight in World War II in Europe? So this is one of the my favorite parts of the documentary um, is where we really dispel the myth of how Niall got into the service. Uh, the myth is, is that Niall heard about Pearl Harbor and ran down and enlisted that day. Uh, but the actual truth is it was a long, deliberate process. And he was actually already on Fairfax, uh, down in Kansas City on Fairfax uh, base, uh, getting training when Pearl Harbor happened. And we have his writings in his war journal from that time. And that period between graduation and when he actually enlists in the military um, shows shows someone who knows that if he doesn't enlist, he's going to almost certainly be drafted. And certainly that Heisman speech is an important piece because you could extrapolate from the Heisman speech um, that quote, uh, you know, I'd rather be warring on the gridirons of the Midwest and not the battlefields of Europe, that, that it is a pacifist statement. Um, I'm not so sure that that's what it is. Um, we don't know because now that we don't have any writings where Niall further explained himself. But you can certainly take it that way. So how do you go from that statement to eventually volunteering to be in the military? And Niall knew that that the war was, America was eventually going to get into it, whether he wanted to or not. And by the time he did, it seems to me from his writings that he, he knew that something needed to be done. And he was aware of the the horribleness of the mechanical war going on in Europe for a second time, and uh, that America could really, really change the outcome. And so by the end, it was about service to his country. And, uh, and, and he's, he's a man who duty was important. And, you know, there was a duty to his parents, uh, a duty to his university or duty to his country. Now Kinnick was going to show up and he was going to be a patriot. And so there, I think there's never any a doubt that he would fight uh, if he was asked to, but he volunteered instead so he could uh, choose his branch of service and he chose to become a pilot. That's incredible. So, so perhaps a couple other questions here, uh, perhaps some spoiler alerts. So if you're not exactly sure, um, you know, how Niall's uh, life sort of comes to a close, you might want to turn your microphone off. Um, but there, there's some sort of myths and rumors around him and, um, you know, his, his last flight there. You, you mentioned that, that it was um, painfully undocumented. Uh, you know, I've heard people say that he could have made it back to the ship, but he didn't want to endanger anybody else. And so he did this sort of water landing. You know, we've, we kind of addressed it that some people thought that he was out of the boat. Some people are out of the plane. Some people thought that he was tethered. Um, what did you sort of find out that was factual or, or even maybe what's sort of your opinion? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good way to phrase it. Good way to phrase it. Um, what we have is what the Navy sent the Kinnick household. And that letter is in the film and we it's read. So you get to hear, hear it. Um, the Navy reports that Niall's engine seized from a lack of oil. He made a safe water landing. His wingman passed over, saw Niall outside of the plane. And then when the rescue boats got there just eight minutes later, Niall and the plane were gone. For me, in my opinion, I'm editorializing here. It doesn't make sense to me that if Niall was outside the plane, that he wouldn't have been able to tread water for eight minutes, being as good of an athlete, and he was a good swimmer as well. We, when we were on the USS Lexington, which is the aircraft carrier that Niall served on, we spent three days on the, on the ship. I asked if they, if they had any pilots in the area who were still alive, who flew the Wildcat, which is the plane that Niall flew. And there was a guy named Joe Sassman. He was 101 at the time. He came back in his full uniform, sat down and did an interview with me. And I had Joe walk me through what it, was, what it would have been like to make a water landing in a Wildcat. Now, Joe didn't do that himself, but of course he was, he was trained to do so. And he walked me through it and he said, it's relatively easy. He said he'd even seen guys make water landings 
get out of the cockpit, walk down the wing, throw an inflatable into the water, step into the inflatable and never get their boots wet. How Nile could have been out of the plane and not survived, I suppose there are explanations. There certainly are explanations how that might have happened. But to me, it makes more sense that he wasn't outside the plane. When he landed, something went wrong. He hit his head, he was knocked out, and he went down with the plane. But we just don't know. We, we don't know. I wasn't able to find his Navy records. Um, the archives, the Naval archives are in St. Louis. I made many inquiries. Uh, they cannot be located. It's possible that there was, a, there was a fire at the archives in the 70s where a lot of records were lost. They might have got lost there, or they might just be miscategorized somewhere. But that might give us more information. We just don't know. And that's why it's so frustrating to me, because losing Nile was a real loss, not just to the state, but to the country, and, and I think to the world. We can get more into that if you want. But I just, I, w I would love to know what happened, because... Niall shouldn't have gone out like that. And it's upsetting that he did. And um, just, I, I would like answers. I don't know if we'll ever get those answers, but just doesn't make sense to me. That's incredible that so much of his life was documented, uh, you know, except for, you know, the, the end. Um, and I know, and I, I don't mean to offend anybody on the call or be sacrilegious. I know people have approached you and said, you know, that plane was never recovered. It would look nice at Kinnick Stadium or, you know, as mm -hmm. some sort of um, monument, you know, what, where have you kind of gone with that? Or what have you done in any research as far as what, how people feel about that, what the plausibility yeah. of it is? There was a time um, where there was some funds raised to go and get the plane. Uh, Bob Feller was a part of that. Erwin Prossy was part of it. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but it does seem like there was some nefariousness then people lost money. Um, and it never happened. I, and, and it is totally, I don't know what the right or wrong here is. This is just my opinion, but I don't feel like holding the plane up and putting it at Kinnick Stadium. I don't feel like that makes sense to me. Uh, what I could understand makes sense is if we're able to recover his body and return it to his home in Adel or to Iowa City, which is the this campus that he loved. I can, I can entertain that. I can understand something like that. Um, and I can also argue in my brain that, that that's something that Niall would have done. He would have preferred to be laid to rest in the soil of Iowa and not the shallow, shallow waters of the Gulf of Pariah. But at this point, what I'm more interested in doing is just going down and diving down there to see. It's shallow water, as I said. I don't know, again, I'm not trying to be too morbid. I don't know at this point what would be left of his remains. But certain things we could extrapolate, like is his seatbelt still buckled? Could be an interesting question to answer if we were to put a dive team down there. But I don't know if we'll ever have that. Obviously that is really, really expensive stuff. And we have to also ask ourselves by knowing those answers, what do we really gain other than scratching a curiosity or scratching an itch and you know answering some sort of curiosity? I know that there are arguments to be had here. And I'm and right now I'm trying not to just have them all out like a Jekyll and Hyde moment where I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but it is it's an interesting conversation. And it is one that I am certainly curious about. What value it actually has, that is a debate uh, I'm I'm worth I, I am willing to listen to. And I think that's a great answer. Uh, still some, some mysteries out there and, and uh, you know, best of luck as you, you know, still continue to sift through that. Um, I think we'll wrap up here with just one, one last question. It's kind of got a similar theme. In all of your research, you know, um, Niall, that last year of, of his um, journal was different than previous years. What do you think he would be doing or what do you think he would have done post-war? This is the this is where I feel like the story gets extra sad, extra tragic. Uh, now clearly had the potential to do great things, and we don't. Know, I, I want to put the caveat out there: we do not know what he would have done. Uh, 
who if he's able to survive the war, which was a question because his younger brother Ben survived training but did not survive the Pacific theater. So if Nile is able to survive, I can only put out my best guess, knowing him the way that I do um, through the last couple of years of research. And I should say it's research, of course, it's not first person, but I think this is how it would have gone. Nile would have gone back to the University of Iowa. He would have finished his law degree. He would have continued to be a public speaker and a public figure. He would have practiced law for a while, and then he would have gotten into politics following his, his governor grandfather. I think, again, we don't know what would have happened, but I think the floor for Nile is clearly interested in politics, is probably governor or senator of the state of Iowa, okay? His ceiling is absolutely president of the United States. That is his potential. That could have happened. And the real tragedy comes in for me where if the darling of the Republican Party in, 1960, in the 1960s and 70s was not Richard M. Nixon, but was Niall C. Kinnock, how different not only the country would be, but the world. How would Niall Kinnock have handled Vietnam? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. There'd be no such thing as the Watergate scandal if Niall Kinnock was president. Just imagine 1960 election between JFK, a World War II hero, and Niall Kinnock, a war hero. That was possible. And it, to me, is just so sad because I really do think that the world, not just the country, and I know this, how this can sound as a guy who just made a documentary about somebody, but I, I really do think that Niall could have made the world a better place through his leadership, his kindness, his sense for justice, and his capacity for grace. All that mixed into a guy who was popular, good-looking, well-spoken, respectful, a gentleman. He's everything you, will, you want in your politicians, but rarely get. And that's why I feel like Niall's loss is so tragic. Indeed. Well, I think you just uh, wrote your next screenplay, and uh, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing that. And we can hook you up with uh, other writers from Iowa that have uh, done a lot of with their screenplays. Scott, uh, your insight is any, nothing like I've ever heard before about Niall Kinnick and where, you know, how he passed, how he lived, what he could have been. Absolutely cannot thank you enough for being on our program. Uh, getting tons of feedback, tons of emails, tons of text messages, even as we're speaking about how much people have enjoyed this. What's next for you? What else can we find out about you? What's your next project? Yeah, just really trying to get the word out about the documentary. So you'll probably see me on some of your favorite podcasts and TV shows and wherever I can possibly be. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll somehow be able to start touring um, the, the film and and maybe me along with to do more Q&As like this around the country for different pockets of Hawkeye fans um, and Iowans that are abound in this country. So we're just going to really keep pushing that. I just did get um, uh, the Navy to approve a showing. Our international premiere will be in Japan on August 26th uh, at, the, uh, our, at the Navy base there where the Nile C. Kinnick High School is at. And so that's going to be really fun to head overseas and, and take Nile's story to a bunch of kids who go to a high school named after Nile who don't know anything about it. And so it's sharing. It's in the naval, naval base, right? It's in the naval base? That's correct. The U.S. Yep. naval base? Yeah. No, so no. that'll be really fun. And then, you know, then it'll just be my life. I, I'm very fortunate. I get to do stuff on Iowa Public Television. I get to do sports talk radio. I get to do public speaking. All those things are great. And now I'll be adding fundraiser for film projects moving forward. Um, and I'm an Iowan, so I hate talking about money. But this is the one part of my job that I don't like. And everybody's got to have some part of their job they don't like. So uh, that, that's what I'll be doing. But really, I will just continue to try and champion the state. I, I want my legacy to be Iowa storyteller. That's what I want to do. That's what I am doing. And I, again, I know it sounds cheesy, but I might be the luckiest guy in the world because that's what I get to do every day. And I'm just so thankful. Thank you for letting me talk to everybody and uh, get the word out about the film and 
Thank you for the wonderful questions. Everybody who wrote some in, thank you. If you have any other questions, reach out to me on email, follow me on social media for updates. I just genuinely thank you. Well, we genuinely thank you as well. Uh, so for those of you that are listening, we'll put this uh, recording out on our YouTube page in a couple of weeks. And our next chat from the old cap will feature Tom Brands and Clarissa Chun from the Iowa Wrestling uh, Program. So join oh, boy. That as well, Scott. We'd like to have you is, there too. Yeah. Oh, Tom's going to be on that. Watch out. Yep. I, his stream of consciousness is my favorite stream of consciousness on the Absolutely. planet. So good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Scott. Best wishes to you and uh, go Hawkeyes.